Hi, in a previous video we looked at repairing this Back to the Future time circuit display from the, the guys at Shack Space in Germany. They sent me this as part of my mailbag, so click here somewhere if you haven't seen that video to watch uh, repairing this. But unfortunately after the repair, yeah we got back, it powered up, we fixed our blow and chip and everything, but we're still not getting any update on the display. So we're going to crack out the scope, crack open the schematics and uh, take a look see what's wrong with this thing. Let's go. Now, I have confirmed with a Jockey, he's one of the designers of this thing, and he said, yeah, this isn't normal, something is wrong with it. I've programmed the code into here, exactly the same as what uh, he's got. He's uh, double-checked that, it's okay, and I can talk to it via the serial port, I can update the real-time clock and everything, so it should automatically um, update the RTC on the display here. It shouldn't be like this. So, there's um, there appears to be something wrong with the hardware. And if I power it up, you might see it change. The top one stays pretty consistent, but this, yeah, that second one there, you saw it. Even the green is a bit dim. Sorry about that. It's uh, It's got more loss in the uh, green uh, diffuser there. It needs to be turned up a bit. So there are slight differences there in the display every time you power it up. It's like a bunch of segments are uh, missing. But more to the point, it's not updating anything on the display. It's just static, basically displaying all digits. So, yeah, something's wrong. So we're going to get in there and probe the chip. The uh, real-time, uh, this um, shield on here, this is only a real-time clock. Uh, basically, there's no extra circuitry on there. The uh, uh, multiplex and drive circuitry is on the back of the panel here. So this is the chip we fixed uh, in the last video and uh, it's identical so we can actually plug this cable into all three displays. We'll try that first. Now what I've done is only plug the cable into the top uh, display here. So I've disconnected the other two boards so they're not uh, cascaded after that. Um, so we've powered up and of course we get that display but look what happens if I touch the back of that driver chip at the back here. Watch this. Ooh, look at that. All I did is put a little bit of force on that driver chip. And you might think, okay, maybe there's um, uh, something wrong with my uh, soldering or something like that, perhaps. And that would be an obvious thing, except for the fact that every time I repower it, it goes back there. And if I touch the chip again, boom, I can make all the segments come on. So when I physically touch the chip, so you might think, okay, that's a solder joint, but it's not because it resets itself every time. It's an electronic fault. It's not a mechanical fault in the solder joint of that chip. So there's obviously some sort of capacitive coupling thing from my finger, even though I was careful not to touch any of the pins, but as I approach, I'm sort of like putting in 50 hertz, all the uh, mains, uh, frequency here in the lab is being picked up by my body and then that is even though I'm not physically touching the circuits on the back just the act of capacitively coupling that I'll see if I can tilt that that is enough ready here we go here we go oh you can't see it sorry but yeah there we go so I didn't actually touch anything electrically but I got very close physically to that uh, multiplexer chip and I've got the cable now plugged into the green board here. And now we're getting exactly the same thing, just all digits lit up. And if this thing worked, if there was something wrong with the display, uh, that with the chip that I resoldered, then we would see these other boards work. And once again, if I plug in the third board there, there we go. No, we're just getting all digits. So the data is not getting there and updating that display. So by seeing changes on this, when I just lightly touch the top of that chip, getting close to capacity for coupling something in, that tells me that there's possibly some sort of floating line, broken connection perhaps, that, you know, we're getting 50 hertz into a line, something like that, and the multiplexer chip is just going, blah, 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 and it's getting noise into it and doing whatever. So potentially there's something along that those lines. I don't know yet. Um, we're going to have to get the uh, schematic out and have a look. But anyway, that's a reasonable first assumption that maybe there's a broken line somewhere and that would explain the lack of data getting from here over the ribbon cable into the boards but hey we won't know until we start probing 
Okay, so let's take a look at the schematic here, which I'll link in down below. It's one of these modular type ones, so it doesn't flow very well, it doesn't show you the system flow. We've got our input connector over here, we've got our output connector here, we've got our seven segment displays just with uh, net names, we've got 74HC164 uh, down here, and we've got the uh, TLC uh, Texas Instruments uh, 59282 driver chip over here so it's a bit and and also we've got the uh, high side uh, driver MOSFETs as well for uh, increased current handling capacity because um, you can't just uh, sync all the current for all the displays through the HC164 multiplexer here you can't do it so if we go over to the uh, TLC uh, 59282 uh, driver chip, very nice little driver chip, it does all the multiplexing and everything else and the uh, latching of the data and uh, stuff like that and also current control as well. Anyway, we'll see how this has been implemented here. Uh, we've basically got our input connector over here which is equivalent to this one over here and we've got our lines coming in, you'll see our data coming in, our blanking line, our latch line, our S-clock line and these are the ones that are coming in here. Now. They're showing that with uh, little joiner dots on there. It's not that. It's actually three. You can see that symbol. So those uh, lines, those three lines, clock, latch, and blank, are all just running in parallel over to uh, all subsequent chips here. And then all they do is daisy chain the data. So data in here goes into uh, data in of the first chip, and then out goes to the next chip, and so forth. But we've only got one chip uh, per board here, one of these chips. So... If we go back to the main schematic here, we can see that the data comes in on the input connector here, goes into the uh, multiplexing chip here, the uh, TLC chip, and then it goes data out. Here it goes, S data out, and that goes off to the next uh, line display over here to the second board and the third board. Now, as you saw, all of our displays are actually uh, showing all of the digits, so they're all stuck on. So that indicates that the multiplexing system is actually working, the data uh, latch and things like that, because it's uh, it's most likely reading out the contents of the data from this, which is just, it hasn't been set up. We haven't set up the data registers in there to display anything else. So by default, power on, it's just displaying all segments. So the multiplexer 74HC164 is uh, no doubt uh, cycling through now, if we have a look at the system that's been implemented here, the main TLC uh, driver chip is capable of uh, 16 segment outputs or 16 LEDs. Where you, we're driving seven segment, well, not seven segment display. We're driving these Starburst displays. So up to these Starburst displays, they're using um, all of the outputs from that chip but when you go over to say the seven segment displays over here which a few of them are uh, they're only they're not using all of the output pins anyway we need all those output pins so one of these um segments uh, can take all of the data output and then we've got our common anode pin here which of course if we have a look goes down to a1 and that's driven via our high side MOSFET drivers here because uh, you need those to get the uh, high current requirements when all of the LEDs are driven. And then the gate of each of these driver transistors, of course, GA1 there, that is driven by uh, effectively what is a multiplexer here, but they're actually using a 74HC164, which is a 8-bit um, serial shift register. So overall, it's uh, quite a simple arrangement. We've got our data coming, our serial data coming in, which is the actual segment data that we want displayed on the uh, Starburst or 7-segment display. And then that data is, is shifted into here based on the S clock, and then once the all 16 bits are in, bang, it hits the latch line like this, and then that switches on and latches the data in uh, straight to the outputs like this. But at the same time, we've actually got a bit which then comes through on here, and effectively we're shifting an individual bit along like this, based on that uh, latch line as well, to turn on each FET in turn like that so you'll never have two of these on at once you're only going to have uh, one so it'll it'll switch on like a zero zero and then a zero will shift its way through turning on each FET in turn and then of course when each FET turns on that means each display turns on and reads the data out from here so it'll just shift across 
in this fashion, displaying the data for each one of those in turn. And we can might be able to see that actually if I set the frame rate of the camera to the right setting. Let's see if we can do that. Well, what do you know? I can't make that top display come and go anymore by touching it. So yeah, I don't know what's uh, don't know what's changed. That's weird. Oh, there we go. No, hey, Sutton changed. <laughs> there we go. Anyway, if I put the camera into shutter priority mode, I've currently got a setting of 1 25th of a second. And as you can see, you shouldn't, re oh, you might be able to see a little bit of flicker on the display. Anyway, let me increase and uh, th that value or decrease it to get a shorter shutter time. Okay, so that's 1 250th of a second shutter speed. And you can really start to see the flicker on the display now. And there we go, that's the fastest shutter speed I can get, 1 2,000th of a second, and you can really start to see the digits <laughs> actually um, scanning across like that. You can really see it. And because it's a very fast shutter speed, you can probably see the uh, noise in the image. It's darker and a lot noisier. There's just not as much light getting to the sensor. Now, there's a lot of people that might automatically say, aha, this is a digital thing, timing. I need a logic analyzer. Well, no, I, for something like this, uh, because I know it's a proven system, or it should be, and the software should be working, we're actually debugging a hardware fault here, and this is where you need your scope and not the analyzer, because we could have a broken line, a shorted line, floating, all that sort of jazz. You don't want to be mucking around with a logic analyzer like that. Only when you're dealing with uh, protocols and things like that would you uh, want a logic analyzer. So we're just going to use a regular scope and take a probe around, see what we can find. And also, even though I've got a four channel scope here, I wouldn't jump straight into actually hooking up all four probes and hooking them up to all the lines. It's just, you know, it, it's just a waste of effort, really. Just a simple probe around with one probe first, just to see if signals are getting there is more than enough. And when you're probing a ground point like this, um, to use one of these uh, alligator crocodile clips and try and clip it into uh, one of these uh, pin headers here, nah, it's going to fail. You're just going to short them out. No good. So make sure you just get one of these uh, headers like that. And uh, Bob's your uncle. No problems whatsoever. Or in this case, I would probably go to the effort to uh, solder on a little uh, pin which jumps up from the uh, ground plane here. And yeah, we're not too concerned about signal integrity at the moment. So the length of this ground lead eh, doesn't matter much at this stage. We're just looking for signal. Is it there or not? Now, if we had to get in there and actually probe this little 0.635 uh, millimeter pin pitch SSOP package, that would be a pain in the ass. But thankfully, this system allows us, it breaks almost everything out onto uh, these header pins here, except the serial data in here. But we can check the clock and the latch and everything else. Okay, so let's start out with pin one here, which is the uh, coal O line. I assume it's uh, column. And bingo, we're getting, we're getting some data there, so that's fine. It's not uh, shorted, and of course, all these little uh, 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 transitions in here, they're coming from the clock line. So if we actually uh, had the clock line in parallel with this, you would see that the clock would be transitioning every period like that, and that's why we're getting those uh, glitches caused by um, coupling, ground bounce, all the other, all the usual uh, signal integrity crap because we're not probing that well so but that's all we want to see is that there's a signal there and it is the correct signal level it's one volt per division we're getting our five volt logic no problems at all coming from the arduino board so that's all right so let's go on to pin two which is the oh, sorry pin three which is the latch line and well the latch line is short it's a much shorter pulse but there it is so our latch line is there no dramas so it's not shorted, it's getting onto the board. In fact, it's not only getting onto the board, but it's going to the output connector, so not a problem. Okay, now our blanking line. Yep, we're getting ourselves a blanking pulse as well. No problems at all. Looking good so far. Okay, the next pin, pin 7, is the serial data out. So let's have a look at that. And that the serial data coming out of that chip will tell us whether or not we're getting data in. And nope, even at the slowest time base setting, we're getting no data coming out. So that possible, oh, that's just the uh, contact uh, bounce on the pin there with my probe. Um, so that tells us that we're getting no data, um, possibly no data into the uh, chip, in, into the uh, Texas Instruments TLC 
uh, display driver chip because there's nothing coming out. Now that could be because the Arduino is not sending any information. It could be a software issue. We don't 100% haven't ruled that out yet, but we're not getting any data out. So there you go, and it's supposed to be. I've supposedly programmed the board to output the real-time clock information. So we're getting nothing there. Okay, that would explain why we're getting all the digits turned on. Okay, now for the clock line, which I'm pretty darn sure we're getting based on the other uh, stuff we were. Yeah, there we go. There's our clock line, and we could see the... Uh, we knew that clock line was there because we were getting the, uh, uh, the transitions in uh, coupled over to our other... Uh, signals. So there you go. It's all there. Looks like we have a data issue. Now we could actually probe the serial data input pin here, but as I said, you risk shorting out those pins and you could actually uh, ruin your Arduino, ruin your board or anything like that. But as it turns out, uh, well, we could like put an extender on here as well. You can actually solder up a little female to male adapter so you can get in there and like extend that out and uh, so you can get in there and probe each pin. But as it turns out, our um, the other end of the cable already has another uh, connector on here, so we can just whack some pins in there and then just probe them easy. Signal integrity is going to be pretty awful, as I said, but hey, we're just looking for signal. All right, so here we go. I'm going to probe these again. This is coming directly out of the Arduino board, and there's the first line, which is the uh, colo line, and then we've got our latch, signal and then we've got our blanking signal we know all those are correct now here it is here's the data aha look at that and we have got very significantly changing data there and if we you know if we got in there and actually had a good look but we are getting data coming out of the arduino board so bingo but there's nothing coming out of our second chip so effectively, what we've got here is all of our signals are coming in fine. We've measured all of those, and our data is at least coming from the controller here. We haven't actually probed at the first chip itself, and it's almost as if, well, it's not getting to that chip. So, because otherwise, all the signals should be there, should be working. So unless I've actually missed a solder joint on there or something, it's not making correct uh, contact, could be. Could be a hardware fault, but the Arduino is certainly outputting some data, which we should see on the display. So, yeah, um, now we have to try and get close to this chip, see if it's coming out, because we measured this. We, we had a second connector over here. It wasn't a second chip. Well, there was on the second board. So we had a connector in here, and we saw that there was no data coming out from this serial output here. So it's either not getting to this chip, or the chip is not outputting it for some reason. And I don't see why the chip wouldn't output it if it's getting in and it's getting all the clock on the latch and everything else. It should work. Okay, I'm going to probe the pin. Now I've got to be very careful and watch the chip here instead of watching the display. So I know you can't see me do this, but probing pin 2, which is the data pin. Yep, it's there. It's there. All right, so we're getting data going into that TLC chip, but nothing coming out. Okay, I'm going to probe the output pin directly, which is pin 22. So I'm going to concentrate. No, nah, nothing. Just high as we saw on that uh, pin header. Now I'm going back to the data line for a second there, and... Uh, we're back on the uh, ribbon cable itself, and if we just single shot capture that, um, we can see that the data is really changing all the time, as you'd expect um, when this thing is updating the uh, the clock. So um, yeah, I've I don't know. Data's getting into the chip. Our clock pulse is getting in. We're, well, we're fairly sure. I haven't checked all the pins directly on the chip, so. That's probably the next uh, bet. Uh, is all that data getting to that chip? But that's the thing. If it was a problem with my rework chip here, then I've already tried, as I showed before, plugging this cable directly in to these other two boards, which are known working boards. Or they were um, when they were given to me. And I don't think I've blown them because they all seem to work um, identically. The multiplexer chip works. We wouldn't get all that stuff on the display if we didn't. Um, uh, even though it's just all, uh, basically all segments turned on. So really, you know, that data is getting across. It's getting there. I'm 
absolutely confident the data is getting to that chip. But uh, I'll check it anyway. And now we'll just have a squiz at the uh, 74HC164. As I said, see if we've got a zero on the gate of these uh, high side MOSFETs here actually traveling across like this. We won't be able to see it uh, traveling across each one because we've got no timing correlation. We've only got a single uh, probe and a single trigger point. But anyway, let's have a look. Pin three is one of them. And yep. Bingo, we've got a zero in there, and if we go to the next one, yeah, we see exactly the same, but if we actually probed, yep, if we actually probed all of those, we would, uh, like, at once, and uh, triggered off one of them, then we would actually see a uh, staggered, we would actually see each one staggered in time like that. So that's just multiplexing each particular digit. But of course, I totally expected all of that to work because if it didn't, well, we wouldn't get anything on the display or we'd get one stuck digit or something like that. So really, it all comes down to um, this driver chip. We know we've got data pro coming in. I've probed that. I have probed the other pins directly on the chip and we're getting the data going in. Our I reference pin is all fine and we're getting... Um, it seem, Well, we're getting no serial data out of the thing and it seems like... Uh, uh, we're just getting basically all highs on the output here, so it's not latching any data, yet we know different data is being shifted into this thing. So unless we get deep into the protocol, it's, jeez, it looks fine on the hardware side, exactly what we expect. Well, I was just about to get all medieval on its ass, uh, hooked up the uh, logic analyzer, got out the um, Agilent 3000 series scope, got printed out my timing diagrams and everything, but I thought, uh, no, look, there's all that data seemed to be getting to the chip, and I've 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 hooked it up, and I've verified. Well, the data's coming out of the Arduino here, no problems whatsoever. So I thought, why isn't it doing anything? I'm as assuming that the software is correct, which uh, Jockey has has uh, assured me that it is. It works on his, and this unit was tested before we sent it out. I thought I would have another probe again to see if the signals are making the chip. And uh, I said before that I had actually checked that and it was the case, but aha. It just didn't make sense if we were getting all of these clocks and data and everything else coming in here and getting no serial data out of here. It just didn't make sense. So it's almost as if the clock pin wasn't actually getting it right to the chip itself and I thought I had tested that but I double checked it and sure enough wah, fail it's a <laughs> soldering issue on, on my chip I looked really closely under my uh, Mantis 3D microscope at a really deep angle so I'm not going to be able to get a good shot at it and it turns out that the um, clock pin pin 3 on the chip that I reworked just wasn't quite making it and I was actually probing the um, the pin I was actually uh, the pad I was probing the pad and there, there was a minute little gap between the pad and the uh, pin itself so the signal is there if you probe the pad but it's not there if you actually probe the very top of the pin now I'm not sure if you'll be able to see this precisely uh, but pin 3 there is the clock pin and this is my scope probe and when I was probing the bottom of that like that it of course if you're probing that pad there's some pad extending out there for the pin no problems whatsoever and if you of course uh, and if you're probing down on the pin like that then that's enough to put force on it and make contact but as you can see there's just not enough solder under there I just missed it and if you probe up here like this and lightly touch it and not put any extra force on it then I'm not getting the signal so the clock signal is making its way through to the pad and but it's not actually getting into the chip bingo so wah, that's a fail on my part I was a bit hasty in my uh, visual inspection of that thing and um yep that's a pebcack but the interesting part of this that led me up the garden path to think that that chip was fine, there's nothing wrong with it, is that I disconnected this ribbon cable over here and plugged the cable directly into these other two boards, which I was pretty sure were not uh, blowing. They didn't uh, get hot. I thought it was only this uh, top board here. So I've totally disconnected my rework board. And if I power that up, if I power that up, of course, 
power that up, of course, um, you know, we just get the same result. So that data is not going through. So that's what led me into a, a false sense of security. That uh, that chip I had soldered was just fine. And because I briefly probed the pin and I saw a signal, yeah, everything's hunky-dory. It's getting the clock and everything. But when I went back to just think about it for a second, I thought, no, oh, there's got... Like, it almost has to be that clock. And sure enough, I went back and looked at it, and yeah, we've got a dodgy joint on there. So I'm just going to reflow that. But it doesn't explain why these other two boards aren't working either. Um, so what are these ones blowing to? And uh, the chip, there's a different failure mode in these chips, and I have to replace those two. Could very well be. All right, so I've resoldered that pin. It should be good now. I haven't actually checked the signal on there, but it really looks good under the uh, Mantis microscope. I've disconnected the second board, so the second and third boards aren't connected. So we will flip this up, and let's power up this puppy and see if it does anything. Woohoo! Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Look at that. We have two other failed boards with failed chips. They just, ah, oh, man, unbelievable. Classic case of being led up the garden path by multiple things. And there's probably people at home just, you know, screaming at me that this was just bleedingly obvious, right? And um, yeah, I'm just an idiot for not, um, not finding it sooner. But there's, that's the thing. When you're involved in this sort of thing, you see these, um, you know, uh, these things, you just miss these things and you get led up the garden path by various clues and oh, red herrings at every corner. And there you go. That's what it was. Looks like we most likely have two other failed uh, TLC chips on these two as well. But those ones didn't get uh, red hot and, and blow the smoke out like the first one. So I just assumed that they survived. And because this one was giving out the same uh, display as the other two, it was oh, unbelievable. There you go. Ha! <laughs> Doll. So yeah, with hindsight, that was bloody obvious. And it, it did finally twig to me that, you know, it like a <laughs> brand new chip I sold it on. The data was getting in there, but nothing was coming out. It's got to be the clock. And sure enough, it damn well was. So I can't imagine how much time I would have wasted when I started uh, diving into the protocol here. I would have found that, of course, it was perfectly fine. And I was, you know, I, I was trusting Jockey. And it, sure enough, he was right. There's nothing wrong with the uh, software at all. It was working fine. So it had to be a hardware fault like that. So there you go. But I thought, you know, oh, maybe it's a signal integrity problem because he talked about uh, he put some termination resistors on the uh, board, for, for example, and uh, but, but didn't populate them on these ones. And well, you know, that could potentially be like a signal integrity issue and stuff like that. So imagine if I went through and started looking at all the timing diagrams here and all the uh, protocol and everything else and then finding no problem there and then going on uh, you know thinking confidently that I've already probed the chip in there and everything and the hardware must be right that and you know then I go well it's a signal integrity issue then imagine the hours I would have wasted trying to uh, actually probe properly because if you want proper signal integrity you can't just use an antenna earthly like this you've got to go in there and um, set up these things uh, properly and well, yeah, ah, oh, man, could have wasted forever. It's lucky I just, you know, stepped back and went, ah, I'm going to double, triple check that clock pin. And sure enough, bloody well was. So I'm going to replace these two puppies here on these other channels. And uh, yes, I did order enough because, well, they cost, what, 50 cents or a dollar each or something. And if you're going to order these parts, you know, I got these from DigiKey in the US because they're not available uh, locally. I think I got them from there. or No, uh, Mouser, I think. Anyway, so, uh, like, it's not like I just ordered them. So I'm, you know, want to make it worth my postage and all that sort of stuff. So, you, you know, you throw on, like, uh, five of them or something. And if you don't use them all, well, whack them in your parts bin. No worries whatsoever. So I'm going to replace those in a few few people commented on the previous video, and I meant to mention this, another technique for getting these chips out, and I'm sure I've uh, mentioned it in a video before, is you can on like these SO type chips, you can actually get in there and uh, cut out the individual pins and then lift it off and then get your solder wick and your soldering iron and just, um, you know, easily remove the uh, pins that are remaining. Or you can get an X-Acto knife and go in there and carefully cut down 
the pins like that. But oh, I don't. It's it's okay, but it's a bit medieval. I mean, you can really, if you put the wrong pressure on it, you can and the wrong angle or whatever, then you can easily uh, rip the pads and do other stuff. So it's you know it, it works, but you just got to be careful. And somebody noted this on the comments, and I thought I got an inkling this was the case too, but I thought, oh, I was just going wonky. Look at the pin pitch of this footprint is slightly out. Look, this pin is like smack in the center there, and when you look, it looks like the errors accumulate as you go further down. So this is a 0.65 uh, millimeter pin pitch, so it looks like the pin pitch of the footprint used in this thing is just slightly out of kilter and if you had a really big chip it would really add up and cause a problem so there's something wrong with that footprint there that's hilarious so forgive me for recording this through my uh, LCD screen here but uh, it's just easier now the interesting thing to note is that nobody in the comments picked up or not that I've read anyway picked up that I had a dodgy solder joint they didn't pick it up at all. It just goes to show the benefit of a, uh, you know, like I can tilt it like that and maybe it'll, yeah, it'll refocus, things like that you can get at an angle down in there. It's going to be nicer if I, when you inspect this after you've uh, cleaned it up, of course, but uh, yeah, nobody, uh, nobody spotted that and I didn't spot it on my first go under either the Tagano microscope while I was doing it or the uh, Mantis but yeah I should have looked better I was pretty hasty I was shooting a video just trying to get the thing done and yeah it comes back to bite you so quite a lot of people do ask which is better a 3d microscope a stereo or you know stereoscopic uh, microscope doesn't have to be a Mantis or whether or not uh, a, one of these, like, you know, either it's a cheap USB webcam, you know, USB microscope or whatever, is uh, better, or even a high-end one like this Tagano, well, you simply cannot beat a proper stereo microscope. Cannot be beat. But these ones are obviously useful. You can get them, like, on a big, huge screen here, and, you know, you don't have to be sort of, you know, hunched over the uh, uh, microscope to see it, but... Uh, yeah, for real proper inspection, you can't beat one of those puppies. Just absolutely, you know, I the only issue with these is that, uh, you know, you have to get your eyes. There's only a small little window where you have to get your eyes so that you can actually see it. Otherwise, it totally shifts out of, um, you know, out of field. You can't actually see it. But, yeah, these things, because you can actually move your head just side to side a little bit, and the angle sort of tilts. It's a bit 3D. Um, that's the advantage of this um, high-end, expensive uh, Mantis one, as opposed to one of the, you know, the regular uh, stereo ones, which I've shown in previous videos. And you can get really quite tired, actually, uh, soldering through these things. I mean, this Mantis, I've um, soldered on this, like, you know, 10, 12 hours straight, and you don't get tired. And the reason for that is because you're distant, you're... Uh, your lenticular distance, I believe it's called, is the same when you look through here down, so it's the same uh, visual path length as when you focus down. So if you look through here and then gaze down here, your eyes don't have to refocus. They don't have to continually refocus between here and here. And so that's why you can work under these Mantis ones all day long. But of course, you know, the uh, uh, USB, um, ones or ones like this uh tagano here they're you know great i mean i've got that on a huge you know um 22 inch monitor there and it's you know it's just fantastic but you know not as good as a proper stereo microscope for actual inspection so i'll just finish this off i've put my flux pen on there and uh we're almost ready to go with our three our three chips yeah, that's the only disadvantage with this Tagane, because the long arm, if, I don't, if you don't have a really steady bench, then, uh, yeah, it's not that great. Can bounce, the image can bounce around, so there you go. That's good enough. Well, really, I should uh, power this thing up uh, one board at a time, but uh, I'm going to go for broke. Here we go. Woohoo! Ah, uh, bottom one. 
What's wrong with the bottom one? The green one's just on, you probably can't see that, it's very dim, but it's there. And the bottom one's doing something weird. Hmm. Oh no, it's there. Sorry, it's just uh, very dim that uh, you can't actually see it, so oops. Okay, let's try that again. And ah, hack space, look at that. Nice. World Wide Web uh, Shack Space. There you go, they got their address in there, World Wide Web Shack Space. Yep, <laughs> nice on the third display, very nice. And there you go, Um, I've got them almost turned up to maximum there. So the green one is quite dim and the uh, yellow one down here was just fine. It's just that it was so dim that it just looked like they were sort of like all on. So, yep, winner, winner, chicken dinner, fixed. Now the only issue with running these at uh, maximum brightness is these suckers get hot. How hot? Well, let's find out. Look at that, they get very, very hot. 70, up into the 80s. Look at that. So, yeah, 85 I saw there, so 88. So, yeah, that's um, for the green. So, oh, sorry about the glare off the lights there, but yeah, 85, certainly worth uh, putting on a uh, little heatsink onto those suckers, getting one of those uh, stick-on, glue-on uh, heatsinks with some uh, thermal adhesive on there. Well worth the effort. There's a and kind of enough room on there, just be careful you don't short out to the pins next to it. Well worth it if, uh, well, I, I plan to run this thing 24-7 uh, um, in front of my live uh, webcam here in the lab. If you haven't seen it, evblog.com slash live. Yes, you can watch me work or not work. Um, pretty much mostly not work um, here in the lab, live 24-7. Fantastic. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to put that up there. So, I don't know, people have something to watch. There you go. But that's fixed. So, what did we end up actually learning from this uh, video? Yes, I left everything in, warts and all. I didn't uh, leave anything out. Well, uh, what did we have? We had uh, the fact that I only had one visual indication, um, like uh, when I blew this thing up, the smoke and everything else, uh, from this one channel here um, that uh, didn't work. So I thought, oh, okay, I've only blown the one channel. And so we went in there, we fixed it, we repaired it, and then all the displays were getting exactly the same thing. So I thought if they're all getting exactly the same thing, foolish me, I should have thought about it a bit more. I could have twigged to the fault uh, then and there, but I thought, hey, if they're all getting the same thing, I don't know, it's more likely to be like a firmware uh, you know, issue or, you know, there's some sort of, you know, I'm not programming the Arduino, right? Something simple like that, because it was probably more more likely than not that I only blew, say, one channel or something like that. And I couldn't remember even if I had all three plugged in at the same time when I blew it. I don't know. I can't recall. But anyway, so that was the first thing. There was only one visual indication of a blown fault. So that was um, issue number one. Then, of course, we replaced the damn chip in this channel and we didn't inspect it correctly. It looked good under the 2D microscope and a brief look under the 3D microscope, it looked good, but I didn't give it as good a visual inspection as I should have. So it was slightly lifted off the pad and it was looking like it was, con uh, looking like it was connected, but it wasn't. So when I probed it, the extra force of the probe coming down on that pin um, made me think that there was a signal there and hey you've checked all of the signals going to the pins and then you get led up the garden path that was a complete red herring there that uh you know led me to think that it was more of a uh, firmware issue and then i plugged it into the same board i was getting the same information and so we went down the path of actually um, checking, systematically checking all the pins and everything else, and it was looking like I was about to launch into this uh, protocol decoding thing when I took a step back and went, eh, hey, you know, I, <laughs> I sort of uh, trusted the original designer of this thing, and really, you know, uh, it seemed to be something else. It was still niggling at me, and I didn't go off willy-nilly. Um, I could have spent all day you know, mucking around, checking these protocols and timing and everything. That was going to be the intention of this video. I came back today and I went, well, okay, you know, look, I'll, I'll hook it up. And I went to the trouble to get my scope out. I hooked up my probes and everything down here. And uh, I was ready to go into that and maybe some signal integrity stuff if I got that far. Oh, what's it saying there? There you go, <laughs> Shack Space. May I, I might leave that in there. 
got to advertise the guys. So all those different things add up to lead you down the garden path to think that you've A, checked it, and B, it can't possibly be that. But hey, you know, when you always go back to the fundamentals, if all the signals were getting into that chip, we should have been getting something different out of these displays. Random garbage, whatever. We should have been getting something. We knew we were getting, uh, we measured, like, you know, information going into these with the uh, display information. The data was going in there, changing data was happening. In. and if it was getting the clock it should have been outputting something we check the uh, multiplexer uh, down in here with the shift register that was driving all that that was all working was shifting through our displays otherwise we wouldn't have got all this and well in the end it was pretty obvious it had to be that that thing wasn't getting a clock and sure enough it bloody well was unbelievable murphy will get you every time so lessons learned there it pays to double check even triple check things to make sure they're right and then not just go jumping into measuring stuff willy-nilly without um you know thinking what could actually be what must be causing this problem once i thought about it you know it must be the clock and i i got lucky it might not have been it might have been something other weird obscure it could have still been the protocol or the signal integrity or something like that it would have been much harder to find that and that's what i thought this video would end up being it's already been going like 40 minutes or something in this video crikey sorry about that but anyway this is my basically real-time investigation you followed me through of me debugging this thing and yeah it has taken me this amount of time to get this far so that's just the real world that's how long these things take and somebody else doing this or me on a different day with more luck might have you know just lucked upon this thing first go or maybe if i had my thinking cap on a bit better and more systematically analyze it too busy you know shooting a video trying to get the thing up and running and stuff like that so you know often it's just a matter of luck of what you probe if i maybe put if i didn't put enough pressure on that probe to begin with i would have found it yesterday and i would have went aha or the other day would have went aha that's you know that's obvious there's no clock getting into that pin and well no i applied a bit extra pressure and sure enough bang it made contact so i ignored that went on to something else tick verified and phew, Bob's your uncle. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that lengthy little real-time uh, troubleshooting and getting this thing working. And it was a complete pebcack on my part. Sorry about that, but I hope you actually learned something. These things are always interesting when you go through them and troubleshoot and very satisfying when you finally fix the bastard. There you go. Look at that. It's a Bobby Dazzler. It works. Now I've got to program it and have some fun. So if you want to discuss it, jump on over to the EEV blog forum. Links are down below. And as always, if you like it, give it a big thumbs up on YouTube. Sorry, you can't really give it a thumbs up anywhere else. It's got to actually be on YouTube. So if you're watching through somewhere else, you can't do the thumbs up thing. Some people have actually asked, where do I do the thumbs up thing? And anyway, if you want to check out this, go on to hackspace.de, uh, I believe it is, also linked down below. Catch you next time. Great Scott! Whoa, this is heavy.